Good evening. I'm Carrie Hammond, and on behalf of the Roberts Foundation Board, I wanted to thank you all for joining us this evening. We are delighted to, that we could, you could all be here with us as, as we honor the Joyce C. Willis Artists in Residence. Woo. Um, we have so many people to thank for making tonight such a success. First, I'd like to thank our Executive Director, Lisa Curran, and our board member, Olivia White, who have shepherded this program from conception nearly three years ago to this very moment. Next, please join me in showing gratitude to our friends Cynthia Ryder, Amelia Ben Susan, Scott Bartleson, and everyone at Hartford Stage for hosting this incredible evening. I also want to acknowledge Steve Collins and Tim Brown from the Hartford Symphony Orchestra, as well as Kim Kersey and Margot Early, formerly of the Amistad Center of Art for Art and Culture. The Roberts Foundation has been blessed to partner with these visions, visionary people and organizations who embraced this vision to advance racial equity in the arts and helped bring it to fruition. In June of 2020, the country was struggling to come to terms with George Floyd's senseless murder. Two weeks later, we sadly lost Joyce, our former Roberts board member, to COVID. And these two events might seem totally unrelated, but to the Roberts Board of Directors, they were a call to action. As a result, the Joyce C. Willis Fund for Racial Equity and Excellence in the Arts was established. To bring the, our vision to life, we turned to three of our grantee organizations, the Amistad Center for Art and Culture, Hartford Stage, and the Hartford Symphony Orchestra, organizations that Joyce cherished and supported. And tonight, we are delighted to introduce you to the three exceptional artists the partnership has brought to Hartford. Photographer Merrick Goma, director Christopher Betts, and composer Quinn Mason. If, if you haven't spent any time with these remarkable artists, you are in for a treat. Anyway, I hope you will experience Merrick's exhibition, now on view at the Amistad, as well as Christopher's direction of Trouble in Mind at Hartford Stage this May, and the premiere of Quinn Mason's commission, She Dreams of Flying, with the Hartford Symphony Orchestra in June. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank Joyce's friends who are here with us tonight, especially Carolyn Harris Burney and her husband, Jim Burney. <laughs> Um, also a former board member of the Hartford Stage and the Hartford Symphony, um, who have been so essential in helping us launch this program in Joyce's honor. And I also understand we have quite a few Atta girls in the audience. So thank you for being here to honor Joyce. And now it's my great privilege to introduce Joyce's good friend, Carolyn. Joyce had a very sweet childhood here in Hartford. Her mom was a gourmet cook, and Joyce learned to appreciate different cultures through food. Her dad would take her to Keeney Golf Course on Saturday and then sneak her into the 19th hole later. <laughs> and Aunt Bertha used to take Joyce on trips to New York to the Grand Museums. Joyce went on to Howard University, came back, had a very successful career at the Hartford, and there she met a group of friends who've become lifelong friends like sisters, the Atta Girls. Some of them have traveled tonight to be with us. She cherished them and their children and their grandchildren. It was also during this time that Joyce became affiliated with the Amistad. She was one of the founding um, directors of the Amistad and spent many years working with them and for them. She especially liked the access that the Amistad gave her to artists, to their galleries, and to their work, and she began her collection. Her home was a little jewel box, and she actually had a rotating collection, just like a gallery, with things stored in the basement. She was a season ticket holder here at the Hartford Stage for a number of years, maybe decades. She loved Broadway, off-Broadway, and off-off-Broadway. <laughs> She was familiar with the Yale Rep and August Wilson, and the rest of us had to run and catch up with that. She spent years on the board with the Hartford Symphony, where diversity was an important initiative for her. She started 
one of the people who started the Duke Ellington Society there, and she loved wearing her opera coat of Italian silk to all of the performances. <laughs> the Roberts Foundation seems to always have been a part of Joyce's life. She always was reading proposals and grant requests. When some of us wanted to go out, Joyce had to read. And it was because Joyce always did her homework that we are here tonight. After retiring, Joyce began her lifelong studies at the University of Hartford. She wanted to study African art, but was told she had to first study European art. So Joyce, knowing Joyce, she would find a little African in the pictures of the European artist. <laughs> and she would write about them. Who are they? Where are they from? Who are their people? As her final initiative for diversity in the arts, Joyce started writing to the deans at the University of Hartford, encouraging them to have a course in African-American artist. And thanks to the Roberts Foundation and their work with the University of Hartford, the university now has a course in African-American art. So tonight we celebrate Merrick and Christopher and Quinn, brilliant young men who are in the spotlight. No one has to peek behind and try to find them now. I told Merrick that Joyce would have loved having them over for dinner and chatting them up about their art. He said, what would she have served us? <laughs> so thank you, Roberts Foundation, for truly making a difference in Joyce's name. Bravo, Joyce C. Willis, bravo. Thank you, Carolyn. It was really important to us that everybody got a really good sense of Joyce as she was so special and such a great, great part of our community. Um, now, I'm delighted to turn the program over to our moderator, Lucy Nalpithanchel. Lucy has been a radio journalist for more than 20 years. She moved to Connecticut in 2006 as WNPR's assignment editor. She's covered every topic imaginable, from education and immigration to juvenile justice, child welfare, and veterans affairs. She has contrib contributed to national public radio, and her stories have aired on several national NPR shows, including Morning Edition, All Things Considered, Weekend Edition, Weekend All Things Considered, Here and Now, and Latino USA. We are delighted to have her here this evening. And ladies and gentlemen, Lucy Nalpithanchel. Good evening, and thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Carolyn, for your words about your dear friend, Joyce C. Willis. Um, Carolyn told me earlier that she feels Joyce here with us tonight, lifting up these three black artists. And we're so glad to see you and to hear you tonight. And it's an honor for me to share this space with you. Now, these artists have some really impressive bios, and for the interest of time, I'm gonna condense them, but you can look at your program to get a better view of their many accomplishments. I'll start with Merrick Goma, a New Haven-based photographer and artist who believes art creates opportunities to look at things from different perspectives. Merrick is the Willis Fellow at the Amistad Center for Art and Culture at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and his exhibition is now on view called my heart is light in the void. Goma tells stories through his photographs by manipulating the placement of each object and the lighting, creating captivating and thought-provoking images. His technique in setting up his scenes is painterly in its execution with close attention to color and lighting. A Michigan native, Merrick is a recent graduate of the Next Haven Fellowship Program, an arts incubator founded by renowned artist Titus Kafar, and his work has been featured in places like the Tilton Gallery and is in the collection of Yale University. Please welcome Merrick Goma. <laughs> Goma. 
Quinn Mason is a composer and conductor based in Dallas and is the Hartford Symphony Orchestra's current artist in residence. As part of his residency with the HSO, he's writing a new piece for orchestra that will be premiered at the closing concert of the Masterwork Series season in June. It's called She Dreams of Flying. Now, Quinn has been described as a brilliant composer who seems to make waves wherever he goes and one of the most sought after young composers in the country. His orchestral music has received performances by many renowned orchestras in the U.S., and as a conductor, Quinn has guest conducted numerous orchestras, and he also recently served as the Houston Ballet Orchestra's youngest ever guest conductor. Multiple prize winner in composition, he's received numerous awards and honors. He recently served as the Detroit Symphony Orchestra's classical roots composer, in residence for 2022, the youngest composer to serve in that role. This April, he will conduct a new commissioned work for the National Symphony Orchestra at the Kennedy Center. And this next bit, he didn't want me to mention, but I'm taking moderator privilege <laughs> to tell you that tomorrow is a special day. Quinn Mason, a happy early birthday to you. <laughs> He's turning 27. <laughs> and Christopher Betts is a New York-based director from Chicago and the Hartford Stages two-year fellow. This spring, Christopher will direct the 1955 drama Trouble in Mind by Alice Childress and a second show next season. I was trying to get him to tell me a little bit about it, but uh, he wouldn't budge. <laughs> He's a graduate of the Yale School of Drama and NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. And prior to Yale, Christopher traveled the world with a focus on African countries as the recipient of a Julie Taymor World Theater Fellowship. He began directing after having his production of Carrie, the musical, discovered by the author of the musical and original film, Lawrence Cohen. This led Christopher to direct a professional production of Carrie, as well as collaborate with the show's writing team to update the script and score. Other collaborations include directing work with the Obie Award winning Fire This Time Festival and the New York premiere of The Cave of Folk Opera. And in addition, he's a founding member, member of the Youth Arts Council at the Goodman Theater. Christopher Betts, welcome. Now, we'll have the opportunity to hear from each artist about their work, but I was thinking about, in, in preparation for tonight, you know, when the seeds of creativity first sprout, and oftentimes it's when we're children, and sometimes it can be later, but I wanted to start to get in the minds of each of you. If you could go down memory lane and share with us that moment, that spark that started you on your artistic path. Christopher, I'll start with you. Yes, um, I remember it so vividly. My grandmother is, uh, is a retired kindergarten teacher. She taught for 40 years on the south side of Chicago. And she would do these uh, assemblies, we call them, which are essentially short etudes around a subject or a theme. And I would go to, uh, when I was young, like three or four, because she taught kindergarten, she would just bring me to work with her because I fit in with, um, I was about the same height as uh, her actual students. <laughs> so there was one performance uh, where they were doing something um, Western theme, like I remember cowboy hats and bandanas, and I had gone to all the rehearsals for it, and then it was time to go on stage, and then I just looked up at my grandmother and I said, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> and she was like, why? I was like, I, I'm nervous, and then I, um, she was like, okay, you don't have to do it. So I sat in the audience and I watched it, and that was the moment that really clicked for me because it was the first time I had seen someone that I love take an idea go through a process with it and go from just a seedling of something to execution, and not just a seedling to execution, but to really involve her community because she would have the participation of her students' parents, they would make costumes, they would sew things together. So it was an extremely collaborative thing and she was, um, my grandmother wanted to be a visual artist, but that wasn't tenable for 
a black woman going to college in the 1960s, so she became a school teacher instead. And she made sure to give art to all of her students, even if they wouldn't be doing it later, like even at a young age to, to just expose them to what art was. And she also actually gave it to the parents as well because they had their participation as community members. So that really informed um, the way that I see art, you know, there's so many visual representations of my grandmother that are in my work. The way that I love to collaborate and hear other people's opinion and, you know, really get like, you know, down into the weeds of what are we trying to make and how can we all collectively make the best thing possible. So I totally uh, credit my grandmother for my entire career because she had all the talent but didn't have the opportunity and I, my talent is completely because of her and luckily I was born at a time where I could also have the opportunity. That's lovely. Merrick, how about you? Did you know when you were a kid that art was going to be your thing? Um, I always existed within the, the realm of creativity. Uh, when I first started off uh, in the perspective of, of making or, you know, producing something, I was always a singer. And so most of my young life, I was somewhere involved in music. And then a point be it ego or, you know, or arrogance, I, I dropped out of music for a little bit and uh, slowly started picking up the visual arts. Um, there's an institution where I grew up in Buffalo, um, the Albright Knox, and just visiting that over the years kind of helped formulate like this idea of, of you know, looking at things and then trying to understand them. Because when I was younger, and still now, I don't really look at wall text, and I kind of always try to imagine what's going on in the work, be it you know abstract or figurative. And it wasn't later until you know pursuing music and then going into psychology, and then finally picking up the camera after all of that, that did I kind of realize like I have to make things. It's like there was a point where. You know, working the nine to five aspect of things, and I had to, you know, stop, you know, making because you know it, it consumes you. And I was at my job, and I just started making things at my job just out of the the sheer, ne the sheer necessity to have to create. And that's kind of where I realized, like, this is something that has to be a part of me. Otherwise, I kind of just fall apart and go crazy, and like, I'm stewing them within myself. And so luckily, throughout my life, my parents have been there in, in a way to help me nurture anything I was doing. Even though a lot of times when you get into a creative field, I didn't have the luxury of a, some, uh, a grandmother who was really into art. My, my parents necessarily didn't always understand what I was doing, but they were always willing to support me. And it was, it was kind of like a, a shift in my, myself that I knew that I had to keep making and creating. And ever since then, I haven't really looked back. Now, I had the opportunity to talk with these artists probably about um, early, I guess a month ago, and everything is blending together. But Quinn told me he's the only musical one in his family. So I'd, I'd love for you to, to share with us that first time you saw an orchestra. How, how young were you? Oh, yeah, I remember that very vividly. It was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, September of 2006. I was 10 years old, and uh, I was in elementary school. <laughs> I have a phenomenally good memory, you'll find out, the more you talk to me. <laughs> but uh, one of the things we used to do with these, was these field trips. I don't know if they do them any longer, but one of the field trips was to the symphony, the, specifically the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, which is my hometown orchestra, to see a production of Peter and the Wolf. And it, it, it's, it's the classic children's piece, right? So it, it, it was interesting, especially since they chose, um, I went to an inner city elementary school, so they chose us to, to bus us in uh, along with other schools from around Dallas. But it was, a, it was the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. It was Peter and the Wolf. And you know who was narrating? I didn't find this out until much later. It was Sting. <laughs> I didn't know who he was. I was like, it was some old guy. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was Sting narrating this thing, because I guess around that time he made a recording. 
But what really struck me was that and that was my very first time hearing an orchestra live. See, before that, I had been listening to classical music a lot on the radio. Um, I listened to my local uh, classical station, WRR, and I was fascinated by all the, the variety of classical music that they played. Uh, I also had a teacher that played some of it in class, and it was around that same time that I started piano lessons, which was a class in school. But that was my very first time uh, seeing an orchestra live, and really, I mean, just uh, he seeing, hearing the story, and then seeing the different instrument families, you know, with the bassoon representing the grandfather, and you know, the drums representing the guns of the hunt. It was, it was very vivid to my my very young mind, and it made me fall in love with the orchestra on the spot. And it's a love affair that continues almost 16 years later, well, almost 17, because <laughs> tomorrow, right? But yeah, nearly a, a, a decade of doing it, and it's like, but but it's it, it doesn't feel that long because it's like I've discovered so much. The more I wrote music, because I started writing music when I was around 12 years old, the more I wrote music, the more I discovered it had that emotional. Uh, I could have that emotional impact that it had on me when I was younger. So, yeah, that was um, that was my story. It started from Sting, everybody. Wow. <laughs> Quinn, you mentioned that you were listening to a lot of classical music, but I am curious about the other uh, genres that have influenced you. So were you listening to pop music too? And you know, how, tell me about the different styles that have you know, influenced how you compose. Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, while I'm the only musician in my family, uh, my mom is, is a very musical person. So she had music playing all throughout the house almost every single day when I was younger. Um, and she grew up in like the 80s. So she raised me on stuff like Prince. She raised me on Sade. She raised me on uh, Phil Collins. Um, and in fact, I think my very first like visceral experience with music was uh, In the Air Tonight. Does anyone know that song? Yeah. yeah. Um, there's like, <laughs> there's like a, a photo of me when I, in 1997 when I was one, wearing headphones and my face is just like this. <laughs> and I, I look at that photo and go, man, it, I, was, I guess I was kind of destined to do music because my mom put all of that different kind of music in my, in my headspace from a young age that it was just like, it just kind of stuck with me, you know? So it was, I, I felt like it was natural that I followed it. You're making me feel old, Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, I wanted to give the audience an opportunity to hear you talk about your work and to see it. So if we could first show an image from Merrick Goma, a photograph uh, that he shared with us. If you could describe, can you see this? Are you able to see it? Okay. Can you describe for us you know, the elements that you use in your particular work, um, whether it's the, the objects or how you use shadow and lighting? Um, yeah, so this is actually one of the photos from the show at the Amistad right now. Um, I like to uh, source a lot of antiques, objects, um, anything mostly from the 1950s and 1970s. Uh, for some reason, that just holds a, a warm and dear place in my heart, um, object-wise. Uh, I, I also grew up watching like the Antique Roadshow. And that's one thing I, I, me and my mom would share. And, and to this point, I can like still, once I watch something and hear like all the prominence of an object, I'm like, all right, that's probably within the $5,000 range. <laughs> and usually, usually, usually I'm about $500 off or close to it. You know, it's, it's always a great feeling. Um, but uh, it's, uh, I oftentimes will just sign these spaces. This is a set within my studio, um, something that I, I built. Um, and I start to compose, and then as I start building it, I start also working on lighting. And lighting is another character within my work, because without the lighting, you can't necessarily uh, uh, ascertain the mood. And so spending a lot of time with lighting and direction, um, I've mentioned this before with other people, that one of the things that's hardest about building a set is curating it so it looks like a real or lives in space. Uh, the when I first started doing photos within spaces, it was already someone else's space. It was already curated. 
already had a, a look or of establishment and you had a, a sense of belonging and being within it. But when I have to build a set, it's more so I, I have to find objects and then I kind of spend time and live within the set for a little bit, moving and tweaking objects as if I was you know, operating or working with them myself. Um, and then I uh, kind of also work within a way that I try to have a narrative or an idea that is available for anyone to enter into and leave objects that people can connect to or you know, draw a, a conclusion from. And then you know, I also write several different stories, not necessarily within the range of like a traditional story, sometimes they're poems, and then sometimes they're, you know, like a play, kind of loosely broken down play of like a one scene play of like what I'm trying to get the person to feel like. And then once I have a person in the space, I give them a light overview of what I'm thinking about. And so that way they can kind of also interpret those feelings too. So a lot of what I'm working with is allowing people to have space to interpret an idea within it. And so by you know, leaving a certain sense of ambiguity allows people to find you know, their own self within the piece or like memories or things that people, I've had people relate to in this piece specifically, you know, the sewing machine, thinking about you know, their own you know, uh, family members who have engaged with the you know, sewing machine. Sometimes it has a very visceral experience with them. Um, it, there's just a lot of things I, I have to think about, and it's it's very meticulous and put together. For anyone who's ever been to my studio, can see that it doesn't really look like much at first, but once like they see the final image, it's like this whole transformation, and it's it's both like the crafting of the lights and the framing, and you know the, the attention to color and detail in itself. The really beautiful, well lit. Um, it makes me think of you know people in my life or an object that I hold dear. Uh, briefly, can you talk about the use of shadow also in your portraits? Yeah, I, I love shadows and works. Um, uh, I think about the shadow. I have a slight. I have a brief his, uh, psychology um, degree. I, I, I don't really use it, so <laughs> I mean, I use it in the sermon of learning to, you know, think about and contextualize some of this work, but, you know, I think about the idea of, you know, Carl Jung and the idea of the persona of the shadow. The shadow itself is not negative, it is what we are unaware of and unconscious of. So sometimes I'll put things in shadows or hide things in the shadows as a way to, you know, give people a slow read. I, I don't like people to be able to digest everything at once. I, I like the slow, contemplative, slowly discovering things, objects, or, you know, you know, mood. There, there's in textures that I will oftentimes place in the work. Um, I enjoy thinking about, you know, shadow as, you know and also another character within it too, it really defines and shapes things. And it helps you to, you know, you can't understand the light without the shadow. Yeah. Thank you, Merrick. Uh, Christopher, I wanted to, I didn't mention this in the bio that I read, but you were the first student in 35 years to direct at Yale Repertory Theater. Wow. Yes, that's true. <laughs> And you directed Choir Boy. Yes, I did. Aww. Can you describe when you're directing you know, your use uh, of light and also of color and what you want the audience uh, to pull from when they're watching a production of yours? You know, that is like the only question I have never been asked before. <laughs> I'm usually so ready. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Um, no, light is my favorite um, design element because um, it, it helps illuminate what you want seen and what you don't want seen, right? It gives you sort of perspective in the same way that film does. So um, in theater, 
light does for me what a camera can do, where it's like, look over here, look at this person's face, look at this expression, don't look over here in this other area. For me, I'm, I'm someone who, I love color. Um, I love uh, big, bold expressions of black people. Um, I love uh, glamorous representations of uh, black people. So you see all of these young men have on sequin jackets. Um, all their uniforms look really great because there's so many ways I, I always opt to in costumes and in lighting, make black people look as incredible as possible. Even if it's a story about black people suffering, I'm just like, great, well, this is being theatricalized, so there's no need for them to not look fantastic while we are representing. <laughs> while we are representing and telling this story. So I don't do shows where black people don't look amazing. Um, so that's pro probably my, the closest thing to a distilled aesthetic I, I have, is just that make black people look great. Um, so, but lighting really, uh, it, it took so much. I'm so thankful that I went to Yale because they made us take the lighting courses with the designers. So, you know, understanding how things work with certain skin tones, how things work if you're doing a show with an all black cast, how things work, how lighting works if you're doing a show with uh, a mixed cast that has uh, people from all social locations, or how things work like if you have a brown set and you have brown people in front of it, at what angle do you want to light things so you can make sure that their faces are being pulled off of it so that we can see what's going on the whole time? Does the wood want to be stained with a little bit of red so that we make sure that their faces are always popping out away from the wall? So it's so much of it is uh, just about being intentional and purposeful and and, and going about that representation of black folks looking great all the time with so much integrity, I think that that's just been distilled to me, again, from my grandmother so much that it, it inspired me to do the research. It's just like, great, well, if you're gonna have brown skinned people in front of a brown wall, how do you stain the wall? At what degree do you light them? Do you need uh, do you need green lighting? Do you use bastard amber? Like finding out the information, and I think that because I knew what I wanted to do, and I've always been clear when I went into grad school, it wasn't like no man's land. Let me try this. Like I could ask my professors if I'm in this situation, I'm doing this sort of play with these sort of people. How do I light it? And I was able to um, acquire the information that I needed because I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew who I knew what community I would be serving. I knew who I would be representing on stage and what type of stories that I would be telling. I like epics, big. Bold. I mostly do musicals, but I love epic plays like Trouble in Mind, like Choir Boy, where it has to be something that we can really grapple with that requires a strong POV. Because if it doesn't requ require a strong POV, then in my opinion, it doesn't really need to be theatricalized. It could be a film. But that strong POV is what makes it work at Hartford Stage, at The Goodman. Like, that's what, that's what makes it work in multiple different spaces is that the writing requires a strong POV. It doesn't just need one representation of the, sto of the storytelling. I, I love that I almost stumped you, almost. <laughs> almost. I'm quick. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Uh, before we move on uh, to hear um, some of Quinn's compositions, you know, I wanted to talk to you and ask you, you know, personally what it meant to direct Choir Boy. I don't want to assume that everyone knows Choir Boy. And so, you know, when we think about identity and representation and the stories that need to be told, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that and what that meant to you. Yeah, it was really interesting because as I was uh, finding my footing as a director, people would always say, "Like you need, you should do Choir Boy. I'd love to see, I'd love to see what it would look like if you did Choir Boy." And I was like, "I want to do Dreamgirls," um, <laughs> uh, you know. And I was very thankful. And I've done, I've done Dreamgirls many times, um, but it, it wasn't like. And I don't say that uh, with any like uh, judgment towards Choir Boy. I think it's wonderful. It's a show that I saw. And I enjoyed my audience experience of it so much that I didn't feel like I had anything to add to it. And then when I got the call from James Bundy, who I love, I'm a James Bundy enthusiast, to do Choir Boy at Yale Rep, I was like, OK. Um, I was like, yes. I was like, it's a great play. It's a great theater. I love James Bundy. I, and I'm still in school. There's no reason for me not to, to do this. And then when I got into the room, I was very transparent with the actors. And I was like, I don't. I was like, I, I know how to make it look great. I can, I can tell the story. Um, and I think that it, it, it stumped me a little bit because my lived experience is so close to the main character, Ferris. It's about a young uh, black gay uh, young man in high school. And he's going through uh, this, uh, essentially he's going through 
an oppressive time in his high school because of his sexuality. They want his talent, but they don't want who he is as a whole person. Sure, yes, obviously, I relate to that. And also, um, it was such a lived experience that I was like, I don't find that interesting. You know what I mean? Because I was just like, oh, like, I've, like, like, I've, I've, like, yes, like, I was in grade school and I got bullied and, like, all of those things, but it was just like, it forced me to look at the story, it forced me to bring more of my humanity to the story, and I have to say it was some of my best work, because it did really make me look inside of myself and pull so much out of myself um, to, to activate it in that way. And um, it's, it's a collaboration that I don't think that I'll ever forget because as someone who is like, yes, that was my lived experience and who has found, who has had the mental health tools and resources to just accept it, right? It was a little bit painful to revisit it, but also it, the tools that I was able to acquire from being able to pull from myself and the way that I was able to support the actors in the room and the way that I was able to make people feel seen and the way that we were able to all put it together collaboratively, that was my best collaboration, even though it may not have been the thing that I was like itching to tell, or it may not be what I would go into an artistic director's office and pitch. And now to the soon to be 27 year old composer, <laughs> conductor. <laughs> I'd love for you uh, to, to describe this composition, but let's hear a little bit of it first. Obviously brilliant, so can you please take us inside your head? How do you compose this? How long does it take you to compose? Where do you begin, Quinn? Well, I will tell you that when I begin composition, I certainly don't feel very brilliant. <laughs> and that's, that's a creative thing, because you have to start from the ground up, and you have to, I'm sure my colleagues here will agree, you have to try to build something out of nothing. And so, you know, having to create all of that from space that looks like this, it was, it was challenging, but it, you know, it, the more you draw on, you know, your, your, your life experiences and things you've been on, been through and your training and things you've learned and, you know, all of that plays a part. And then the creative process at that point becomes very enjoyable. And I would have to say for this particular piece, the, the creative process was very, very enjoyable. And it's, um, some of my most, I mean, as a person, I'm very introverted, I would have to say. I love to keep to myself, and I don't like to bother people. That's just me. But, you know, with this, I, this is very, obviously very extroverted, right? And so um, it, it's drawing on those different aspect, aspects of my personality that um, informs work like this, you know? So what is it like when you spend all this time composing and then you hear an orchestra play what you created? That's a, it's, it's a very special feeling because, you know, uh, I'm sitting at, I'm, basically what I'm listening to is the whole, while I'm composing is either A, nothing, if I'm writing by hand, uh, I'm just basically using uh, the sounds in my head and I very, barely use a keyboard to, um, to compose, or B, uh, if I compose on the computer, I'm using something called MIDI, which is software sounds, and the, the software sounds just don't, uh, I don't dig it, man. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's not, it doesn't have that human element that, hu uh, you know, in a symphony orchestra could give you. Um, and so, hearing, listening to the MIDI for months and then going into the first rehearsal, 
and then listening to it with uh, musicians in a symphony orchestra, which is usually what I work with, is very overwhelming experience because you know here are these musicians on stage, human beings, who are bringing all of their life experiences and all of their um, training and all of their, um, you know, and they're together as a collective putting effort into this, this piece that I have written. And it's, it's very much a harmonious sound. It's really lovely how you describe that. So you must feel an enormous sense of pride, but have you ever been moved to tears? I would have to say close. I didn't really, uh, there was no, no, nothing that came out of the duct here. <laughs> but I did have, I did have an emotional uh, reaction to one of my pieces one time, two years ago. Yes, two years ago. I, um, I wrote a piece called Svitani, which is a piece uh, for string orchestra. It's a Czech piece. Uh, it means dawn. And it was written two years ago as we were coming out of the pandemic. And I would have to say it was emotional for me because I was thinking about everything we had been through as a human race and everything that we had, you know, we had worked together and we had come out of this, we were coming out of this thing. And so I wrote this piece as kind of a, a, kind of a recovery thing for, for everyone else and for me. And I conducted the premiere with the Musica Nova Orchestra in Phoenix, Arizona. Very great orchestra. It was amazing to conduct them, and it was a it, it was a very emotional experience conducting that piece. I'm glad you brought up the pandemic because we are three years this month into when the world changed, and we lost people that we loved, and so much. Um, so many people struggled and are still struggling. And uh, Merrick, one of your, I believe, works, your Absence is My Monument series. I'm wondering if you can talk about that particular series, about isolation. And I understand you started it before the pandemic, but the, the special meaning it took on during the pandemic. Yeah, your Absence is My Monument um, kind of came at a time when there's a lot of change I had just finished Next Haven. I wasn't sure where I was going to be living. I was thinking I wanted to move to stay in Connecticut, but still figuring out if I was going to move back to Buffalo. Um, my grandmother had passed away the two months before um, in uh, October. And um, a year prior, one of my close friends also passed away. And so. It was kind of going through Next Haven was kind of a whirlwind experience of just, you know, making and kind of just putting things out there. And then finally, I had a point where there was a reprise, and I had to really think about everything and come to like a conclusion of like, have I really actually processed any of this? And I hadn't. <laughs> I, had, I was so willing to push and keep going that I hadn't actually taken time. So I spent time writing and reading. And then finally, you know, just started working on this project. And then COVID hit. And I think at that time, I was also very receptive to a lot of things that were going on around me because I kept coming across these instances and these things that are like very visceral moments. Like there was a point where I was just getting off of the New York subway. This is actually before COVID, but. Um, there was a, a, a guy who was unhoused came up to me and asked me for money. And I was kind of just dismissive. And then later on, another man came up. And he said to me, like, the cops are crazy around here right now. And I was like, I guess. And he says to me, are you, you guess? Can't you be more definitive or more sure of yourself? I'm like, yeah, sure. And then he, he pulls out the Bible and starts you know, speaking scripture to me. And Ezekiel, he says, and he starts playing it on his, also playing it while he's reciting it on his uh, boom box that he had, like one of those portable boom boxes. And then the guy who asked me for money came up to him and asked him for money. And the guy just shook his head and his, as he took a drag from his cigarette. And he looked to the guy and said, what was your happiest moment? And then the guy kind of paused for a moment. And he says, I used to run track and I felt like I was one of the fastest kids around. And that kind of like that moment kind of made me think about, you know, his loss, 
of, you know, this guy was probably obviously addicted to something, and, but he still was holding on to that moment. And so I was trying to think about what happens when something is gone and what, operate, what takes up that space. Like absence, by speaking it and invoking it, it, it becomes something. It's not nothing. And so where is, the, where is that something? And that's kind of where your absence is my monument kind of came from, thinking about what has to take that place of that loss. Sometimes it's, you know, you know, drugs. Sometimes it's, you know, pushing it down. Sometimes it's just ignoring it. And so I was also thinking about all of that through COVID and thinking about like what you what you asked him about when were you ever moved? I think I was only moved by some of the one of some of the writing I wrote for that. I had to do a oh, I didn't have to do a reading, have to read. I did a reading with a friend. Uh, and actually there's a point where I had to stop and I, I was almost brought to tears in that moment. So no, nothing came out of my ducks either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but it, it stopped me. Um, but it's, it was kind of like realizing that there's still a lot of some things for me to process. And so that informed me to just keep working on the work itself. We're going to be giving the audience uh, a chance to ask questions of these three artists in just a couple of minutes. But you know, I wanted to talk about equity. We know through the Roberts Foundation and Joyce C. Willis' memory that the importance of lifting up black artists and the importance of engaging diverse audiences. And there has been a turn uh, in this country since the murder of George Floyd. There's still a lot more work that needs to be done. But I'm wondering if you can talk about representation in your artistries, where the work needs to continue. I'll start with you, Christopher. Yeah. Um, I am one who is a, an enthusiast of black women. Um, I was raised by my mother and my grandmother, and I try, the way that I try to remedy that with my very limited <laughs> amount of power in the American theater wing is I try to uh, hire as many black women as possible. And when I have choice over what shows I do, I try to do shows that are either all black women or that have as many black women as possible because so much of what I do is totally indebted to black women. And it is maddening as a black person when um, the arts, the arts and the people who are in charge of these institutions don't feel the same need to do that in their programming because this country owes so much to African-American people in terms of arts, in terms of wealth, in terms of everything in this country. So any measure uh, that is not taken to try and, to try, it's, not, it's, it's, it's almost like a, it, to try to um, acknowledge how much has been stolen monetarily, creatively, artistically, spiritually, from black people and indigenous people, specifically in this country, is a slap in the face. And I think that, uh, I think that when those opportunities come along, in the same way that I'm like, well, my entire aesthetic is indebted to black women. So let me do my damn best to make sure that I have a black woman lighting designer, black woman costume designer, that I have some black women working on, on, on it, that I try and do a show with uh, black women actors. That same initiative and that reverence and that acknowledgement and that grace needs to be given to all people who have suffered um, due to the brutality of whiteness in this country. And those initiatives aren't taken. And that type of programming and thinking has to happen immediately. And it has to happen with grace. And, in, and not just like, we will program this show this month, or we will program this one show in this season. It should be with enthusiasm that we want to do this in a way that really lifts up and, 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 and makes up for all the egregious errors that this country has made um, up until now. I will stop there, because I'm getting a little worked up. <laughs> Uh, 
Go ahead. Yeah, um, it's quite an interesting story. So when you think of classical music, you think of European, you think of Europe, right? I mean, it's very much a European art form. And there is this um, saying in classical music that we only play music of, quote, dead white guys. Um, and that, for the most part, is true. Um, is fa in fact, if you look at most orchestral seasons, you will find the symphony of Beethoven. You will find the symphony of Brahms. Or very rarely will you find a Haydn symphony. Thank God. I don't really like Haydn. <laughs> Um, but like most of that stuff, and uh, even going into the 20th, 20th century and somewhat into the 21st century, um, and not that there's anything wrong with those works, but when you hear them like, when you hear the Beethoven Seventh Symphony, the like three orchestras in three weeks, something's wrong. And I actually did, in, in Dallas one year, saw three orchestras do Beethoven Seven in three weeks. I'm like, there's really nothing else you could have programmed. Um, but I, I would have to say in the past three years, um, well, let me back up just a little bit. So I will tell you that I've been going to classical music concerts since I was 10 years old. And I've been attending primarily the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Um, and I really, I did not see a black com composer on the program until I was like 22. And that black composer was me. <laughs> that was my very first commission for the orchestra. But in terms of their subscription series, you know, the main stage series, I didn't really see. I, I, I mean, I knew of the existence of the, the great um, African-American composer William Grant still, but nobody was really programming them. And then we're now starting to get the music of Florence Price, who died in 1953. It's starting to now get programmed a lot more. In the, so in the, in the past three years, I would have to say, programming has increased a lot. We're starting to see more women on the programs. Also, that's another thing. I didn't see my first female com conductor at the Dallas Symphony until, until Karina Kenalakis came in. That was like, what, when I was like 18? <laughs> but the point is, it was like, it was interesting not seeing myself represented in the concert hall and having to discover this stuff on my own. I felt like I should have been taught it in school. Um, and I, now I, I hear it's being taught in the schools, but I wish that it had been taught back then. And as someone who is kind of um, coming up, and um, now I'm starting to do a lot of um, Conduct, a lot more conducting. I'm starting to program my own concerts. Of course, I'm going to amplify, amplify my uh, underrepresented colleagues. I, uh, we're starting to be represented more, so we're starting to hopefully come out of being called underrepresented. But you know, I'm making a point to uh, make sure that my female colleagues are heard, that my uh, African American colleagues are heard, and you know, my indigenous colleagues are Native American composers too. But yeah, it's um, it's it's still something that's fairly new to orchestras, symphony orchestras in the United States, so much so that they don't know how to market it. And so they just, it does sometimes feel like, you know, uh, token programming and, uh, and people have called it out. And if, has anyone heard the name Jennifer Higdon? World renowned classical music composer. She's a female. She, she, she has a Pulitzer Prize, and yet, you know, sometimes when they market her music, they don't even put her in, like, you know, the marketing materials. Oh, and she calls it out. She's very vocal about that. So, you, and you have to listen to a Pulitzer Prize winner. So, but yeah, it, seeing stuff like that, um, now I feel like that or symphony orchestras, which, you know, a lot of people like to call them cover bands of the 18th century. <laughs> It's, it's true to an extent, but I feel like more orchestras now everywhere, especially, you know, I, I work with a lot of orchestras everywhere. They're actually trying to make an effort to, you know, make this normal. Not, you know, it doesn't have to be news every time there's a black composer is played or a female composer. It should just be normal, you know? And I, yeah. And so we're starting to see that happening. So I, I would have to say, if, if we keep going at the pace that we're going in the orchestral world, um, I, I feel like that in, in like fi five more years, we're going to see like a, 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 a equal representation on the program. So nice. Thank you, Quinn.
I wanted to give an opportunity for the audience. We just have a few minutes, unfortunately, but um, before Merrick, I'll let you uh, chime in in a second. But if, if anyone wanted to ask a question, now's the time. Raise your hand. <laughs> anyone? Okay. I really can't see you with these bright lights, so <laughs> I just hear voices. Hi. Uh, I'm a representative of the Roberts Foundation uh, on the board. And my question to you as a young uh, artists and uh, creatives, do you see a, a responsibility uh, of the artist to um, entice those who listen to you to move into action beyond listening to your, to your work or, or looking at your work? That's my question. Um, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think sometimes as creatives, we put our work out in the world and we kind of just hope for someone to catch on to it or to find something within it. Um, I think we only really truly have control when we actually engage with these people. And I think that's one of the important things of engaging with you know, the audience as well as, you know, engaging with the work. Uh, I, I always believe there's this importance to leaving things behind written in a way that, you know, if this work lives on beyond me, beyond me, then there's, you know, a record of what is said in a way that can express what I'm trying to get out there in the world. And there's so many points of view and so many different ways to enter into anyone's work, like listening to anything that we put out there, or my biggest thing is just always to hope to inspire someone to see that this could be done. And I, I myself, growing up, didn't really expect this as a career. I didn't have a model or an, a vision of someone until I was in my 20s. And, you know, it wasn't until then that I'm like, oh, this could be something that I could, you know, make a living off of. Everyone always has that, that, you know, that traditional statement of the starving artist. And so it's always a push away from it, but there are people who can actually generate and make things and put it out there in the world and still you know, be okay and financially fine. And it's, 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 a, it's a slap and it's a, it's a struggle at times, but you know, I think we do it because we love it, not because we're expecting anything more out of it. Did you want to touch on the equity question? And what, I think we have time for one more audience question if Scott wants to find the, the next sure. question. But go I'll, ahead, Merrick. I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, I think the, the important thing is to also to kind of touch on what I said before, show that there's a model of something that can be done. Like the, I think the biggest thing that a lot of us can do is just put ourselves out there in a way that we want to inspire people and also to lift up voices that, you know, we think are very important to have out there. There's so many people that I will gladly, if someone's like, oh, you know, do you know anyone else? I will gladly point out these other artists of color. You know, I wanna see things that represent me and represent the people around me and the people I grew up with and the, my family. and. You know, my father's from Nigeria, my mother's from the South, and it's like there's these two different worlds I'm a part of, and I'm always interested in seeing where all these different, you know, worlds collide, but also and to celebrate their diversity and differences um, in, the, in the short and uh, short long of it all. Do we have time for one more question from the audience? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Shall I stand up? Do I need to? I guess I do. I'm glad I'm sitting back here, and I'm glad that I'm on the aisles. But I'm terrified to ask this, so I, I'm, if, if I need to, I'll be able to run out before people throw things. <laughs> but um, I'd like to know from the three of you, do you feel a need to balance? And if you do, how do you balance being an artist versus being a black artist? And if there is a need to balance, how long do you think this will need to be done by artists who are 
women artists or happen to re represent what is called an affinity group. And um, is it something that is difficult or frustrating for you? Christopher? Is it something you even think about, I should ask? Um, yeah, so I grew up on the south side of Chicago and, ev and like that area is like, super black, so and everyone's like super, super happy to be black. Um, so I think that for me, I totally understand that question. For me, like let's say, you know, I think uh, there's so many times where like, I think equity is a great thing to strive for, but like, it's so interesting, but I think diversity isn't a thing to strive for, right? Like the world is diverse, that's something that we need to accept. Like that's like, like the, the world is diverse. We just need to make it more equitable for folks. And a lot of people's definition of equity is being treated like a straight white man. And I don't want to be treated like a straight white man. And I think that everyone needs to be like, well, this white man, I don't care what this white man is over here doing. I don't want to be treated like a white man because that's part of the problem. So equity is not me being treated like this straight white man. Like that doesn't have anything to do with me. That created obstacles. So why would I want to be treated like someone who created obstacles that put me in the situation that I'm in? So for me, I don't want to enter a space. I want everyone to be like, that is, you know, I don't want anyone to pick me because I'm a black director, but I very much identify as a black director and as a black artist because there's so much in the, the call and the charge of what I do. Now, why that is placed upon me I see, I, you know what I mean, why that call and that charge is placed upon me. Yes, there is a reason for that. And, you know, other artists who don't, who may not have, um, who may be a part of like, uh, who are straight white men who, who don't have diverse social locations may not be, may not have that. But I just love my people and I love, um, I love the way that we can transcend and make beauty out of anything. And I love how resilient we are. And. <laughs> I never want to be seen, I actually never want to be seen as just an artist. I always want to be seen um, as a black artist because we can't go back. Like, we can't go back and erase everything that has happened in this country. And because we can't go back and erase it, we need to accept it and we need to fix it. And I am carrying the fact that my grandmother could not be an artist because she was born in the year that she was born in. And I am carrying that forward. And the spaces that I walk into need to understand that I'm, that, I, that I'm carrying my ancestors in a way that they don't have to. I, I kind of want to tag on to that. Like, there, there's an aspect of, like, our work that will never be viewed specifically just as artists. There will always be the tagline attached to us as, or black artists. Just like, you know, within, with women, they will always be charted as a woman artist or women feminist artists. These, these are just, I think of them as boxes. And I think, I, I don't know if I speak for all of us, I think we're bigger than boxes. And I, I think that there is an aspect of ourselves that, you know, we can just be artists, but I'm gonna hold on to that title of black artist because for me, Sometimes it's a bad honor. Like, got you, got you, got you. All right, there I go. <laughs> I got another one. You can't stop me. <laughs> you make it work. You make it work. Um, it, it's it's but it's 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 a part of me, but it's it's and it it doesn't necessarily define everything about me, because mm -hmm. you know blackness in itself is so vast. And you can't necessarily put that just that one category in a box, and so that's one of the things I always think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just real brief. Um, when, when it comes to writing about particularly um, uh, uh, interesting subjects pertaining to social justice, uh, that's something that I feel like more and more composers. Um, of color are feeling more confident to do nowadays, uh, as opposed to even three years ago, where we couldn't have had um, uh, composers. Uh, you wouldn't have, if you looked at a subscription series, you probably wouldn't have seen anything titled the Four Black American Dances, which the Boston Symphony actually played, I think, a month ago. Uh, and that's by the composer Carlos Simon. Uh, that wasn't me. But, <laughs> But when uh, I, I did realize that uh, my voice was very much underrepresented in the concert hall, as someone who grew up in the inner city and you know, had very 
limited access to this. You know, I had mentors that helped me out, but I, as far as finding it on my own or trying to pay for it, that probably wouldn't have happened. So I did find a need to uh, celebrate how far I come on that particular stage, which previously seemed unaccessible to me. So I, for my first commission, um, I very much, uh, I wrote a piece called Inner City Rhapsody, which is uh, the journey of a fictional composer from struggle to light, but it's very much my um, story. And I was very unafraid to write that. In fact, I wrote a blog, blog post in the, uh, on it, which is still on my website, where I was like, you know, I, I really wish that um, you know this piece is seen as a, a great representation of um, a composer in co of, of color in the concert hall, and just the beautiful music that, that they can create. And we have some amazing composers of color and some female composers writing amazing music today. And now they're afraid to do it, because now they have a platform to do it, and people are, people are listening and trusting us, so. I think we have to leave it there, given the time. But I want to thank Quinn Mason, Merrick Goma, and Christopher Betts for the insight you've given us. Sh should we embarrass Quinn and sing happy birthday? What do you think? <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. She knows it. Okay. I see you. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> We hope you have a great night. Thanks for coming. <laughs>